So I was invited to tell my story, but telling my story would either mean to talk about my favorite football team, which I can assure you would not be a good idea at the moment, or it would be about some other topics that I'm dealing with every day, um, which are basically related to design research in the context of interaction technology. So it would basically be about how people interact with things and with machines, which I'm sure some of you already know a lot about and some of you might find a little bit dry or abstract. So instead of telling my story, I would prefer to start with a short story about a very nice old lady called Mary Ann. And Mary Ann, she used to live in a small town not far away from my hometown, Cologne. And Mary Ann was a very interesting but also a very interested person. She was always curious about the things that happen in the world. And so she was curious, um, yeah, she always wanted to know more, she wanted to learn stuff, so she was curious about science, about technology, and uh, she was into art and cultural activities, and she read a lot of books. She also wrote little stories, short poems, um, so, and she knew a lot. She traveled a lot, um, uh, so she always had interesting stories to tell from her experiences. And generally, Marianne was absorbing a lot of information. And she was also one of those persons who loved to share this information with other people. And that was the reason why she was always surrounded by many people. Um, she had a lot of friends and they loved her because of her stories, because of her knowledge. Um, because of her empathy, she was a very social person, um, she was a good listener, so people would come to her place um, when they needed advice or when they had a problem, um, or they would just come and hang around at her place um, to have a good time. So Mary Ann was a very, a very happy person. Even when she found out that she was going to lose sight, um, so her eyes became, or her eyes got worse. But even that didn't seem to bother her so much. Um, uh, on the one hand, it was a kind of a process, so it didn't happen from one day to another. Um, it started with night blindness. Um, later, she had this kind of tunnel view. In the end, she was almost completely blind. So, and she was a very positive, a very optimistic person, and she was also very pragmatic. So Mary Ann said, well, people get old, and when they do, they just cannot do things anymore as good as they used to do. So she said, I'm getting old, I might become blind, that's how it is, that's life, I'm going to face this situation, and I'm going to be okay as long as I can still do most of the stuff that I like. And she did. Marianne would still go out and meet people. She would invite them to her place and she would um, go to travel. She would go and visit art exhibitions. She would go to the cinema or theater. And um, so she would do most of the stuff she did before and she would still absorb a lot of information and share it with other people. So actually, nothing so much changed in Marianne's life. Of course, some things changed, and also she had to, she had to change some of her habits. For example, she um, stopped reading books, but instead she started listening to audiobooks quite a lot. Some things didn't work that well. Um, she tried to learn the Braille language, but it wasn't really her kind of thing. She felt um, too old for it, and uh, she also had the impression that she wasn't really in need for that because she felt she had everything she needed. Also her kids and her husband would read out loud important newspaper articles for her. So um, Marianne was fine with that and she was still happy. Until she found out that besides losing her sight, she was also going to lose her ability to hear. So her ears also got worse. 
And this was probably the first moment in Marianne's life where she really got worried. She really got a little bit nervous because she said, how's this going to work? How, um, what am I going to do? How am I going to live life? Um, how am I going to communicate with my people? Um, where will I get my information from? Yeah, how am I going to do that? So she got nervous, but again, this was a process. So it didn't happen from one day to another. She still had some time to prepare herself to that situation. And even though she was in her 90s already, she became really active in this um, topic. And she really got curious about um, all of those things. She dived deep into the topic of visual and auditory impairment. And um, she found out about deafblind people and how, how some of them can communicate. And she also learned about a certain way that some deafblind people have to communicate with each other, um, which is the so-called LORM alphabet, which is uh, some kind of tactile hand touch alphabet where certain characters are assigned to certain areas in the hand, and it basically works by touching each other. So people place the sentences, place the characters and words into each other's hand. So Marianne said, um, I'm going to do this, um, I'm going to learn it, and she did. And so did her family members and some of her close friends. So by the time she was almost completely blind and deaf, um, she would have about a dozen people who she could communicate with, which was uh, very helpful indeed. And, um, but of course, life changed a lot to the way it was before. Um, it became much, much more difficult to her, not only to her, but also to her beloved ones and her relatives, and um, things were much, much more different now. And um, even though she had those 10 or 12 people to talk to, it wasn't the same. Before, even when she was um, only visually impaired, she would be able to talk to anybody in the world, and she did. And uh, now she only had these few people who spoke her language. And even these few people were not always reachable to her. Because if she wanted to talk to a person, um, she really had needed this person right next to her because um, she had to touch the persons in order to speak to them. So um, this was difficult to her. She had this barrier, the barrier of language, the barrier of distance communication. But still, she was a positive and happy person, and um, people would perceive her like that, like a happy person, until the time when two of her beloved daughters had to move away. They moved because of jobs reasons. They had to move to other cities. And that was the second time in Marianne's life where she really got nervous, scared, angry even. She got really sad, and in the end, she got really depressed about this situation because she knew she was kind of going to lose them. Um, she didn't have much time left. She was very old already, and she wouldn't have the chances to literally stay in touch with her daughters. Marianne died when she was 93, and um, most of her life, she was, as I said, a very happy person. And she probably didn't die because of depression, but people who knew her, um, they knew that her last couple of months, um, she was a sad person and almost kind of a broken personality. And this is where Mary Ann's story ends. And it would have been interesting to meet this person a little bit earlier, especially since at our design research lab, we're currently developing the so-called mobile LORM glove, which is a communication device that translates the German LORM alphabet into digital text and vice versa. And um, therefore, we use small fabric pressure sensors that are located in the palm of the glove um, that allow the deafblind user to compose text messages that are transmitted to the receiver's phone or computer. And on the back of the glove, we have small vibrating motors that allow the wearer to perceive incoming messages. So now it really becomes possible to send and receive messages. We have a small Bluetooth module that transmits the data to the smartphone. So now you can send any message from either one glove to another glove 
or from a glove to a computer, or um, you can send it to a mobile phone, and of course you can also send it the way back. So you can send SMS or email, which also allows you to talk to more than one person at the same time, uh, which can be very interesting if we think in terms of including students into a classroom or generally people into society. So to come back to Mary Ann's story, I must admit um, it had a little sad ending and to be quite honest with you, I made it up. Um, <laughs> well, I didn't make up the mobile loan glove, but I made up the character Marianne. There is no Marianne. At least no such person that I personally know. But what I do know is that there are many more people like her out there, and I've been working together with some of them during the last couple of months. And we can be quite optimistic that less of them might have to suffer from things like depression in the Europe future. In Germany, we have about three to 6,000 deafblind people. Not all of them can actually learn the LORM language, but the ones who can and the ones who would be able to use such device, like the glove, um, might have a better chance to be more integrated and included into our society. Which brings me back to my story and to what I said in the beginning. Um, I am a design researcher and I'm deeply interested in um, the social impact that design has and the social impact that design can have because obviously we designers do not only shape the things that surround us but we also shape the social processes that are related to these things. Thus, we designers also have an impact in how such things like a disability can have an impact on a person's life. So instead of talking about disabilities so much, I think it won't be a bad idea to go out and actually start to design abilities. Thank you very much. <laughs>